what I was going to do um, today then um, was give you guys um, an overview of um, a paper which we've got submitted at the moment. Um, hopefully, um, given that we've got revisions in, it might be published in the very near future. Um, and this is a continuation of some work that I've been doing with my own furred and feathered friends for quite a while, looking at zookeepers um, and their interactions and relationships with the animals in their care. So um, human animal interactions in zoos then is something I guess I've been preoccupied with for quite a while. And just to give a little bit of a background for those who haven't listened to me before or don't have so much of a background in human animal interactions in zoos. When we think about human animal interactions, we're usually talking about that dyadic um, one off event where you've got a human and an animal and either of them might do something um, in the direction of the other. When you've got multiple interactions occurring, you might then get the development of a relationship and that relationship is where either of the, those um, individuals might start being able to premeditate or have an expectation about what the other might do because there have been that many interactions that have occurred. And as a consequence, we might expect those relationships to be positive, neutral or negative. Now, a very positive relationship might lead on to a human animal bond. And a human animal bond is where we would expect both the human and the animal to appreciate and have um, a positive um, expectation um, of that relationship and feel that they gain positively from it. Now, as a consequence, that might be really hard or can be really hard to empirically demonstrate for our animals, but it is actually something quite easy we can survey people about. And as a, a consequence, myself and Jeff Hosey have done a number of projects looking at um, zookeeper animal bonds. And then more recently, though probably in the last 10 years, we've been gathering a whole load of other friends and colleagues to join us in this work, trying to expand our understanding of these human animal bonds, so the human animal interactions and the relationships. Now in a, a key paper um, some years ago now, Jeff, and so that's Hosey, Jeff Hosey, um, sort of outlined that one of the defining features of zoos is people. And more recently, um, and it's, it's taken quite a while, people um, are beginning to appreciate um, people in zoos. And so certainly there was a, a great paper um, by Cole and Fraser, which also um, sort of supported this idea that given that people are so ubiquitous in zoos, that if we're thinking about zoo animals and their welfare, then we should be thinking about the impact that those people have. Now, those people can be categorized in two different ways. We can think about people who are familiar to the zoo animals, um, and these are a whole variety of different zoo professionals, or we can think about people who are unfamiliar and those are our zoo visitors. Now, increasingly, zoos are incorporating um, a whole variety of human animal interactions with zoo visitors. And so um, there's been some research and certainly one of my master's students a couple of years ago looked at the impact of keeper for a day programs, for example. And this was a phenomenal um, project because she was able to look at familiar and unfamiliar people doing the same role in the same place. And the only difference was that one of those was a familiar keeper and one of those was um, a person taking part in the keeper for a day scheme. And what she was able to find out was that people, uh, that, that the animals would significantly move towards their familiar and not uh, move towards the, the unfamiliar. And so there, the animals were differentiating um, between the unfamiliar and the familiar, but there was no um, data that suggested that there was a negative consequence for the animal itself. Now, today, most research has focused on the zoo visitor effect. Um, and so looking at what impact zoo visitors going around um, the zoo might have on animal welfare. But, um, one of the things that I guess I and a number of the people that I've been working with 
are also really keen to look at, which can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to, to, to sort of implement, is zookeepers. And so zookeepers, again, have a huge role in um, the lives of animals um, that they look after. And so it, to my mind, it's interesting that all these years, and I have to say I'm one of those people, we look at housing and husbandry, how big is the enclosure, what substrates are we using, how are we feeding them, are we giving them enrichment? And it's only fairly recently that we go, oh, those people that you do or don't interact with or who hang out or who feed you or the people in your lives that are there for your whole life, how do they have an impact on the welfare of the animals in zoos? Now with um, Sam Ward um, and part of her, her master's research was looking at um, and, and demonstrating that one way that um, zoo animals are getting these um, keeper interactions is through positive reinforcement training. And unsurprisingly, um, certainly if, if one uh, thinks about the, the psychology um, phenomena, that positive reinforcement training reduces the latency that animals will then respond to their keepers. So not surprisingly, if you have a positive reinforcement training program, your um, animals will respond to you far more quickly. And one would say you're not doing it well if they don't. Another um, uh, a project that, that Sam and I then looked at was looking at the relationships more broadly. And so this research was able to demonstrate that within any single keeper animal dyad, so the same keeper and the same animal interacting with each other on a number of different occasions, that those relationships did have an impact on rhino, zebra and Sulawesi macaque behaviour. So we have some nice evidence that shows that these interactions can have impacts on behavior and potentially welfare for the animals. We do have data that shows that relationships are actually formed between a particular keeper and an animal. When it comes to bonds, as I was saying previously, it can be quite difficult to um, get information from the animal's perspective, but certainly um, with colleagues, Jeff, um, Linda Burke, um, and um, also uh, colleagues in, in Australia, we've looked at um, surveying zookeepers and they will almost always say that they have a bond with the animals in their care. And they will have a bond with whichever animals they happen to be looking after. There is a, a, a new paper that's come out, which is really interesting because that then extends and goes into this realm. I was saying that's quite difficult to, to get data on where they describe that a bond, they feel a bond can be described because they're able to demonstrate positive benefits for both elephants, the animal in their study, and keepers. So one of the questions that, that we as a group were really interested in taking it further is to then think about, yes, keepers have bonds with the animals that they work with, but how does that relate to how they might feel about other animals in their lives? So anecdotally, there is a presumption that most people feel very attached to the pets in their lives. Um, and um, so what we were interested to look at was, is there a comparison between how keepers feel towards the pets in their lives and the zoo animals they look, um, look after? Now, quite helpfully, um, owner pet relationships is something that has been studied to quite a large extent. And we were able to use the Lexington Pet Attachment Store um, score. And we made some adjustments to that so that we could look and ask keepers for information about how attached they felt to their pets and how attached did they feel to the animals in their care. Um, and this is a much younger version of me and a Sulawesi macaque and um, a slightly less younger, but a lot younger with uh, my previous dog, Erin. So in a, a, quite a large group um, with colleagues, Lindsay Skiner, Linda Burke, Sam Ward, Wendy Shaw and Jeff, um, we initiated this multi-zoo collaboration, which includes zoos and universities in the UK, Australia and New Zealand. And um, we surveyed 187 keepers in 19 institutions. And we asked the keepers to com complete the pet scale and then also that modification that enabled us to compare attachment in the zoo animals. We also asked for additional data on demographics. 
Now, um, I'm going to just show you some snapshots of the data. Um, and all of the graphs are set up similarly. So along the y-axis and the vertical, we've got the mean zoo attachment score. And then along the bottom, we've got the different taxa. And what you can see is that keepers responded fairly uniformly, that they had um, a, a high level um, of attachment to all of the different taxa um, that, that could be looked after. Um, above the bars, there's the standard, well, on the bars, there's a the standard error around the mean, and then above those is the N, the number of um, keepers who were looking after and um, spoke to those different taxa. When we then compare this to the pet attachment score, again, we've got the mean pet attachment score up the y-axis, and we've got the different types of pets that people um, responded to having. We can see that there is a slight variation in how attached people felt to those pets, but on average, they, they again had a high level of attachment to the pet that they chose to have. Um, and indeed, um, there are a couple of um, uh, outliers in terms of having a sheep or a, a Eastern, um, Eastern Rosella or a budgie, those and, and even a Konya were quite small numbers and probably speaks to our um, Australian and New Zealand um, audience, whereas a dog, we had 90 respondents and cat, we had 40. So those are the more typical of the pets. Now, when we um, looked at the zoo attachment score by institution, this is when, to me, things start getting a lot more interesting. I don't think we're surprised that people, uh, that keepers felt that they had a good level of attachment to the animals in their care. I don't think it's that surprising that um, zookeepers were also attached to the pets they have. What now I, I want to show is along the bottom are all the different zoos that we got data from and then the mean attach, um, attachment score to the zoo animals on that y-axis. What we now see is some or, or a lot more variation in the level of attachment that the zookeepers were prescribing to the animals that they look after. Now, for some of these zoos, it's true, they were quite small and we had um, quite low reporting. So we had one keeper, these two, we um, these three, we had three keepers. But this zoo, we had 69 keepers. And that is a zoo that has a very, very small standard error. That means that essentially of those 69 zookeepers that took part in that survey, they all agreed pretty uniformly with each other. And that it seems to be um, as we start getting into these larger zoos or the zoos with greater responses, 19 zoos, 70, uh, 19 keepers, 17 keepers, we start getting quite a, a, a strong consensus between um, the attachment they feel they have to the animals in their care. So when we then do the statistical analyses on these data, what we find is that the zookeepers report to having a higher attachment to the pets in their lives than they do to the animals in their care. Now, when I report on this, I wanna be nice and careful um, about how I, I describe this because it has been discussed and certainly um, chatting with the, the colleagues that we wrote this with, but also outside of this study, that what we're reporting on is what keepers have told us. Now that might represent what keepers are comfortable telling us, what keepers feel they should be telling us and or what keepers feel. Um, but what we can say is from the data that we have, the, they're reporting that they have a higher attachment to the pets in their lives than the zoo animals in their lives. Another thing that I find quite interesting, especially because I had a review back once saying, but there are differences between species. How can you presume that keepers feel the same about different species? Of course, they won't feel the same about, and I would suggest that, well, they suggested a difference between mammals and other taxa. And in actual fact, there is no difference between the attachment scores that keepers ascribe between different species. So if you're a keeper who looks after a mammal or a non-mammal or a different type of mammal, the attachment score is no different. 
So there, there is no, no species distinction in how much keepers feel attached to the animals in their care. But one thing again, and this I sort of alluded to already, is that there are significant differences in how keepers from different zoos report their attachment to animals. So depending on the zoo that you work in, you feel or you report having an attachment which is very similar to other, the other keepers um, that you work alongside. Now, what's interesting about this is that we went to great lengths to ensure that um, surveys were undertaken independently, that they weren't undertaken in groups. So there wasn't uh, necessarily conversations between people going, oh, did you give a three? I gave a seven. Oh, maybe I should have given a five. And so in actual fact, I feel fairly um, confident that what we're seeing here is a product of either um, an, uh, of a zoo culture, of how zoos are operating so that keepers within a particular zoo are more similar than keepers in a different zoo. And so this again, for, for someone who's worked and, and researched in and around zoos for most of my career, this is, this is one of those ones I personally find as quite, quite a pivotal moment. A lot of us working in zoos know that zoos are different. We know that visitation and visitors are different. But collecting the type of data that provides the empirical evidence to demonstrate that zoos are different is really tricky. And so this paper, relatively simple as it might be, provides us with some of the first data that are able to demonstrate that there is some type of zoo culture which has an impact which makes keepers within that institution more uniform than if they worked within another zoo. And so keepers in one zoo are more similar to each other than keepers at another zoo. Now, what leads to this zoo culture? It could be many things. Potentially keepers um, who are similar um, might um, be employed, therefore recruitment might employ a type of keeper. It might be that through training and expectations and um, just the way that operations are scheduled within a zoo, it molds people towards um, a, a similar type of culture. But what to my mind is really interesting is to think, okay, now that we can recognize that there is this zoo culture, how might that have an impact on keepers in terms of job satisfaction and the perceptions of their animals? And this again is where I come back to this idea of, are keepers reporting on how they feel or how they feel they're expected to report on their feelings? Um, but also how does this then have an impact on the animals? And maybe it doesn't at all, um, but certainly it adds a whole new dimension to thinking about um, the impact of, of stock people, of zookeepers um, in the lives of animals, and also thinking about how zoos might have an impact on zoo professionals. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge and, and thank obviously the, the, the collaborative effort um, and the rest of the, the team that took part in this. Um, and also just to highlight that there are a number of other projects going on at Hartbury that are a little bit similar um, at the moment that um, the, one of my PhD students um, spoke at the Biasa Research Conference talking about conservation communication in meet, meet and greets and that I've got two undergraduate dissertation students at the moment, one um, working at Chessington looking at the impacts of zoo experiences on animal behaviour um, and another who's looking at breeding success and including the potential impact of keepers on, on that. And then I personally have a, a, an ongoing mission uh, exploring the impact of zoo visitor animal interactions on mental well-being and society. So if you've questions on, on any of those things and or would like um, a copy of the graphical abstract um, or any other information, then please ask.